It started with a Facebook post. So in 2017, the summer of 2017, I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw a post by a Muskogee legal scholar named Sarah Deer and an appeals court, which is one step below the Supreme Court, had just affirmed that her tribe has a reservation. And that reservation had not been acknowledged by the state or by the federal government in over 100 years. So it was a big deal. And I kind of knew that, you know, whatever courts are saying about the Muskogee reservation, they would probably also hold true for my tribe's reservation for Cherokee Nation. And I had this immediate sort of visceral sense of justice because sort of like I mentioned, my ancestors, you know, had died literally for this land. Um, for this land that we were promised when we removed uh, West and it hadn't been acknowledged in over a century. So this idea that um, we could gain that status back uh, really intrigued me. And so I started following it in 2017. I've been following it since then, you know, for the book, like you said, we did a ton of historical research. We collected um, hundreds of primary source documents for the contemporary story of the case, you know, I interviewed family members, police officers, lawyers, um, to really put the whole story together. And, and just to give a synopsis um, for folks, the book covers a Supreme Court case that resulted in the largest restoration of tribal land in U.S. history. Um, in 2020, the Supreme Court upheld the reservation of Muscogee Nation. And this historic case came from kind of a surprising place, actually a small town murder in 1999. A Muscogee citizen murdered another Muscogee citizen and he was sentenced to death by the state of Oklahoma. In the course of his death penalty appeals, his lawyers argued, hold on, wait a minute, Oklahoma doesn't have jurisdiction over this crime because it happened on a reservation. And Oklahoma said, you've got to be kidding, like that reservation hasn't existed in over a century. And so that question about the status of the Muskogee reservation went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, so the book kind of closely follows the case from the original crime through the different steps of the appeal. And then it, like you said, interweaves that history of both both our tribes being removed from our homelands in the Southeast onto land that would later become Oklahoma, and then how Oklahoma was created on top of those treaty territories. So I think it really shows, it showcases in a way how the past is really connected to the present. So the first narrative really covers the story of the case. So it starts with um, the murder of a man named George Jacobs, who was um, pretty brutally killed in 1999 by um, uh, two other men and the main defendant named Patrick Murphy. Um, so that's kind of like the first chapter is like the crime and Patrick Murphy, the trial and Patrick Murphy being sentenced to death. And then that story picks up with um, after Patrick Murphy tries a few different appeals, he gets what's called a federal public defender and everyone on death row gets those. And she kind of opened the case up and investigated it from the ground floor. She made this really interesting um, realization that the location uh, that Oklahoma had recorded was actually wrong and it started her kind of down this rabbit hole about jurisdiction, um, which led her to this reservation question. And then that question goes all the way to an appeals court. The tribe gets involved, Muskogee Nation enters the scene, enters the chat, so to speak. Um, and wins. And so the tribe has this huge win, this unprecedented win at the appeals court, which is one step below the Supreme Court, but then Oklahoma appeals, and then they have to fight it out at the Supreme Court with the eventual decision. And then the history is actually in two big chunks. So the first chunk is um, the story of our tribe's removal from our homelands in the Southeast to land that is now Oklahoma. And that part really does focus on the story of my ancestors and why they decided to sign our tribe's removal history. And then the second history chunk, I, I think people will actually find really interesting because it's a really important of American history that when I'm out talking with folks like outside of tribal communities, a lot of people have never even heard of it. And it's this thing called allotment. And so, our tribes, you know, existed um, outside of any U.S. state. Obviously, we still had to interact with the government, but we owned land communally and governed ourselves. 
And we went through this process called allotment where our land was divided up and assigned to individual tribal citizens. And then Oklahoma was kind of created on top of that land. And what followed um, was an unimaginable amount of um, swindle, uh, fraud, theft, uh, kidnapping, and even murder. So basically settlers who had come to what was then called Indian territory were basically willing to do almost anything um, to wrestle that land out of tribal citizens' hands. So it talks about, um, it follows one woman's story in particular, a woman named Millie Naharkey, but then also talks more broadly about how Oklahoma was really created um, through this almost criminal conspiracy, um, but through this vast amount of theft of tribal land and the impact that that had on tribes and tribal citizens. Um, so that's the book. I would say, you know, the the there's a lot of mirroring. So, you know, there's a lot of statements that public officials are making that are, you know, shockingly the same between a century ago and today. And so I think people can start to understand the pattern of, um, you know, colonization and how indigenous nations have been treated in the United States. From start to finish, it was about three years. Um, so, and then of course I had been reporting on the case for much longer than that. So if you count going all the way back to the beginning and since 2017, I've been, been following the case. I use like those like big easel kind of like sticky notes and I have a blank wall in the room where I write. And so I'll put things up on the wall and um, I would do it in big cycles. So um, I wrote the book in like three big chunks. Like it's kind of, there's kind of like a part one, part two and part three. And after each chunk, I would sort of read it and think about the structure. And, um, you know, it was hard to nail. Um, one of the hardest things to nail was sort of where as you go between the present day and the history where the story leaves off and picks back up. Um, that was really tricky and took a lot of iteration. So um, sometimes I say, you know, I'm not a great writer, but I'm a good editor. <laughs> so I, I'm sort of one of those people where I just try to like get it all on the page because I kind of just have to understand the material in a way and then, you know, figure out how to move all those parts um, and, and honestly, for me, it takes like a few different tries. It takes many tries <laughs> before I feel like I get it right. And, and that one of the challenges too was um, because of the double weave of the story and that the narrative was already complicated, the stories within each of those weaves had to be pretty like straightforward and linear so people could follow the big story. And so there was a lot of um, winnowing and simplifying in the editorial process just so that, you know, the reader could really stay with me. I, I really think that it's important. Um, I really try to write in a way that's very accessible and accessible from like, okay, I get this. I understand this. Like, I know what this person is talking about, but also storied so that there's, there's a drive, you know, like I, I read books for research all the time, but what I read for pleasure, I read for the story, for the connection to people, for, um, you know, my curiosity, you know, wanting to stick with something. And so I really wanted to write a book that had that kind of drive that would propel people um, through all of the information. So, but it took, it took a while to get there. <laughs>